Yeah. Something just happened that says that I know that. Yeah. 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 Now, it's so easy to say, oh, they got a chip on the shoulder. What's, what's their problem? This is America. Pull yourself by your own by your boots, boots, straps. Come on, get with it. Yeah. It's the people coming together to say the tyranny and injustice of this having to survive. Yes. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Well, look at this here. Not a pleasant sight. I don't suggest we, you know, get into the habit of doing these sort of things. But one of the issues of the life experiences of what's below that water visibility level uh, has been a history of police. Do you know that the folks in Ferguson had been saying for years the police target us by skin color? And of course, with the shooting of Michael Brown, they said this is the icing on the cake. And they felt like no one really believed them. And then the Department of Justice comes in, and I printed off the uh, report, 107 pages. And they say from the top to the bottom, the Department of Justice, this police department, from the top to the bottom, has passed around emails, jokes, uh, uh, contests to see who they could arrest. Uh, more this week, next month. I mean, it's all documented. I'm seven pages. I, I, I wished I could uh, give you a copy of it. You would not believe that in the 21st century, this kind of orchestrated mindset was allowed to, to listen to this, give someone a fine, knowing they can't pay it, put them in jail for 10 days, and then they can't get a job after that because they just lost it. Over and over and over and over. And then the talk and the use of the N-word. So you would not believe human beings on, in, the tw in 2015 were talking out like this. The Department of Justice came in and proved it in 107 pages. And then you know what? The people of Ferguson said, we've been saying this for decades. Why is it that you don't hear us? We've been asking for responses and answers. And, and then it takes a Department of Justice report to prove that it's true. Are we not worthy of something? Are we that marginal? Are we even that invisible? In a sense, it's so easy to see a riot and say, what a problem we have here. But guess who said this? Who said this? You would think maybe not. A riot is the language of the unheard. Guess who said it? Dr. King. About a month before he was shot. But it is not enough for me to stand before you tonight and condemn riots. It would be morally irresponsible for me to do that without at the same time condemning the contingent, intolerable conditions that exist in our society. These conditions are the things that cause individuals to feel that they have no other alternative than to engage in violent rebellions to get attention. And I must say tonight that a riot is the language, language of the unheard. Dr. King, a man who lived and died for nonviolence, acknowledged that you see an event, you see an outward 10% of that iceberg, but underneath, there's something much more. Ramadan, what's that? You ever heard of Ramadan? Yeah, it's a month of fasting, and among what group of believers? Yeah, Muslim, yeah. Uh, it's the ninth month. Um, According to the lunar calendar, and uh, it'll be about uh, mid June to mid July of uh, this year, on which they hold a fast in time. And how long do they fast? How was their fasting schedule? 30 days. Yeah, from sunrise to sunset they fast. And it's a real strong call. It's one of the five principles, five pillars of the Islamic faith. Now, what if you're a teacher teaching summer school? And you have a student who's taking care of Ramadan, and yet his scores, his grades, sometimes even his absence at school may get hampered because of his fasting experience and because of his health and whatever else. Are we the type that would say, hey, get with it? Or are we the type that would say, tell me your story? 
You say, oh, it's easy and it's so quick to say, well, hey, I don't have time for this. All other students don't have this uh, excuse. But see, the question is, are we going to go beyond the, the tip of that iceberg? Or are we just going to say, you don't fit the mold, so you're out. You don't fit the mold, so you get a one point out. Do we honor people? Do we honor individuality? Do we honor difference? Something that is sacred to them. How about this one? Uh, a number of people, whether Seventh-day Adventist or maybe uh, uh, the Jewish faith. What if you're a boss and you need people to work overtime Friday night? Now consider, if a person says, I won't do it, I can't do it because of this, is that a good enough reason to you? See, the question a lot of times is, if unless they bring it up, we'll just measure them by their outward behavior and say, okay, this person is slacking off, this person doesn't want that promotion because they aren't willing to go the extra mile. It's so easy to do that. Now, this book came out many years ago. And let me ask you a question. How would you answer that? You see a number of students at a university setting or a community college setting, and all the black kids are sitting together in the cafeteria. What comes to mind? Can you come, when you see that, what comes to mind? Segregation, what else? Socialization, what else? Yeah, they're not comfortable sitting with others. Safety even, yes? Yeah, things in common. Things in common, yeah, very much so. And in a sense, when we see that, you should take a peek at that book, it kind of blow your mind. When we see that, we normally rush to judgment that this is not that positive, though. They're being cliquish, or they're, uh, uh, they all have this chip on their shoulder commonality. Uh, and we kind of rush to judgment so quickly. Very interesting. Without seeing what's below that 90% of the iceberg. How about this? When uh, we have an event at, at a school, do you think, especially in Spokane or a rich area of uh, Native American heritage, do you think we should have a moment of silence before we carry out a major event for the ancestors' blood and graves, sites on whom we're walking? Yeah. What do you think? Or is that too much? Or is that too political correct? Or too uh, correct? Or is that too sensitive? What do you think? It's too time consuming. Or too time consuming. <laughs> and yeah, it's not convenient. <laughs> not convenient. But you think about it. Uh, it's an amazing thing that every October 12, 13, and 14, I, I even have some ads that show uh, this, this word uh, discovery. Columbus Day and Discovery Sale at, at uh, Macy's or something. And I'm thinking, I wonder how many Native American folks in this area see this word discovery. I mean, think about it. I mean, let's see, who like, do you like cars? How about a white Mercedes Benz convertible 2017? Would you drive it? You sure would. I can see you kicking off that hat. For the man be leaning like this. Pulled up to him and just look at you. <laughs> I can see it, I can see it. Now, how about in my more than rust 1967 Volkswagen, I drive up and you're at the stoplight of Division in Francis and I pull out my uh, 357 Magnum and I look at that car and I go, Hi, I'd like to discover your vehicle. <laughs> Think about it. How much disregard have we granted the indigenous people in this part of the world? It, it's really quite shameful. And I think about how much we have left Lewis and Clark. I don't know if you check with the Native American with an indigenous folk, what they think of Lewis and Clark. They might use the T word. You know what I mean by T? Terrorist. Well, we would, we would never do that. We have schools in the name of Lewis and Clark. What do you mean terrorist? Well, what I mean is they came and settled my parents' living room at 3 in the morning. I don't consider that honorable. In a sense, see, the side, the perspective of the Native American, we aren't never even acknowledged. It's really quite sad. In a sense, we put away their differences and said, stay on the reservation or become like us. Now, this uh, here, I've had this issue a number of times. A number of young students in my classes, either here or at Eastern, have said, uh, here you're going to show a video tomorrow. I cannot make it. 
because it has a level of nudity, nudity or, or curse words that bothers my uh, conscience as a Christian. Should I kick them out of class? Should I dock them? Or should I make up something special for them? Should I excuse them? It's, a, it's an interesting topic. But you know what? The easiest thing to do and the quickest thing to do is to say, hey, this class isn't for you then. All I know is the 10% of the iceberg that I deal with fits all other students. I don't care about what the other students are. And, and lastly, do you remember, do you, do you know who this is? Who is this? They, they call her the mother of the year. What did she do? This young man was riot, not rioting, he was protesting, uh, maybe leading to the riot, I don't know, in the Baltimore issue. And uh, of course, uh, I'm not even going to get into the case of what happened there, but um, some of the things that have gotten away with the militarization of our police, um, I believe we're seeing an iceberg. Uh, on one hand, I believe very few police officers uh, are problematic, but the ones that are bad, or the departments that are bad, there's over 30, what, uh, thousand different police departments in this country, but the ones that cross the line really cross the line, and sometimes they cross the line as, uh, as a department. I don't believe most officers live that way. I know too many of them. I know most of them want to serve the public, and from eight to five, want to do that, and then they want to go and actually see their family. I mean, really, I really believe that's the majority, clearly, of the police. But the ones that cross the line, the problem is the lack of justice, as mentioned before. And in a sense, here's a man saying, I gotta get out there and protest. And then his mother comes and uh, whacks him pretty hard on TV. And everyone uh, kinda enjoys seeing that. Yet, a number of NFL players recently, because of their spanking of their children, have been told, you're barbaric and you can't play football anymore. Uh, this whole idea of how to parent, how to raise a child, uh, whether it's a black cultural way of contact and, and loudness and violence or whatever, it's an interesting kind of commentary on how we look at people and how we even put people in a category. I, I even saw one advertisement uh, with this picture said, uh, don't send in the National Guard, just send in the moms. <laughs> and uh, in a sense, you know, it's kind of... Uh, Kind of entertaining to think that, but in another sense, it's a strong stereotype too, and uh, we, we won't go there. I just want you to be aware of that. How about this? Recently, there was a shooting in Texas, Garland, Texas, just north of Dallas, and uh, what happened there? Yes, uh, we know that a number of extremists, uh, and I believe ISIS said they even take credit for that. It's unfortunate, just like the KKK is an extremist group, so-called Christian, you have uh, the, the ISIS that are also very extremist, so-called Muslim. We shouldn't judge the, the people of the Islamic faith by these extremists. We shouldn't judge the Christians by uh, the KKK behavior, who hold a Bible in hand as they lynch someone. So, but, what happened here was a cartoon contest. And it was to draw the best picture of, Prophet, of the Prophet Muhammad. And that is very offensive. To who? To the Muslims. And so, in a sense, I don't know, was this taunting? Was this, and the person, if you look more into it, the person behind this so-called cartoon contest that knows it upsets the Muslim people among us, she's on a crusade to be as anti-Muslim as possible. And unfortunately, it ended up in this sort of thing. So, we build our futures in closing together in the words we exchange today. And a lot of our words, unfortunately, are based on that 10% of what's above the waterline. And unfortunately, not even investigating, seeking to know the riches below that line. And because of that, I think this is a true statement. The quality of our communication really is the measurement to say what is the quality of our life. If you just communicate, you can get by. But if you communicate skillfully, you can work miracles.
And I really, really believe that's the line of humanity that we all want to be on. And we all have the potential and capacity to do it. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Our ability to look at events and to look at individuals and to look at difference from a whole other perspective will open up, like our brother Kyle mentioned, a whole new world to us. And of course, Dr. King made this statement that unfortunately, it's still the prescription that we get to take 50, 60 years later. People fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated. And in the end, I believe John Maxwell does it well. Leaders become great not because of their power, but because of their ability to empower others. And I, I would just like to end it with this. If we want to know how to empower others, how to be a servant leader, how to be a person that becomes a bridge of communication, the number one skill is listening. We must have the ability to listen. But most of us only hear as people tell us their story, if we even stop them to go that far. And while we're hearing, we're just thinking about what we're going to say back. But listening means to put aside your perspective, to put aside what you call the norm, and to actually listen to what this person's story and life experiences are. The result of that is validation. Every human being, from the day they are born until the day they die, seek validation. When you listen to someone, not just here, you automatically validate them. That validate always leads to a level of trust that will blow your mind as to what kind of oneness and harmony you can have. Because out of trust comes mutuality. And out of mutuality will come the teamwork of really being what we've read here today about being culturally uh, communicating with each other, interculturally. So when you think about listening, provokes validation. Validation brings in trust. Trust brings in mutuality. And mutuality brings in the e plural assumption that I think we're missing because we hardly ever listen to each other. We only hear and, and rush to judgment. Thank you. Appreciate it.